what I want to talk to you about is looking at uh, engagement care. You know, it's a big topic for a lot of folks. And I could have taken it one of two ways when I decided to uh, prepare the talk today. And so the, the, the focus that I'm taking for this talk is going to be really kind of looking more at uh, something I think is important, especially to OHS providers, is no-shows. And so it's, um, I've always been curious about this and like what, what's out there that's been proven to work, you know, as opposed to, you know, there's some things we, we kind of know, but what's out there that's been published. And so uh, by preparing for this, is, it was really good for me because I learned some things I didn't know. Okay, so next slide. I don't have any conflicts. Here we go. And then the next slide, please. So what, uh, and so what I will clarify about the factors, uh, two factors that relate to, so when I hit that slide, I'll talk about, about poor retention and no-shows. I, I learned there's client factors that uh, are things within the patient. For example, uh, their, their, uh, personal, uh, clarify, like their disease condition or th uh, things like that. There's also uh, factors that are related to outside the patient. So for example, uh, their income or something like that. So, so it was interesting when I was doing the work that finding out that there's different factors that either live within the client or the, the, the community they live in that uh, affect retention and no-shows. And then also uh, when I, I put together some tables for some strategies, uh, but just so you know, everything in this talk, uh, there's some tools that uh, we came up with that uh, Maria will be able to share at the end, you know, the email that they share uh, after the, the meeting, tools and resources. So I've created some uh, handouts for everybody that they can use in their clinic and also uh, patient factors as well. So it, it might help later down the road to maybe help pinpoint who are the patients that we really need to be focusing on. And then uh, what can we do that's, uh, that's been researched and proven to work? Uh, next slide. So like I said, I, I mentioned that uh, I'm gonna take the no-show perspective in terms of uh, the talk today. So, you know, the, the one of the most obvious me methods anybody in ambulatory care has seen is, you know, miss visits, no shows. And so uh, that's often, uh, you know, how, how that's calculated is that we just look at uh, how often that they don't keep an appointment and what that ratio is to their, uh, to their appointment, their, their kept appointments versus the schedule. There's also a, appointment adherence. I, I can tell you, you know, this is discusses how number two, how that's calculated. That's a little complex for me. You know, when I looked at that, it's like, well, I don't know if that's really something I could relate to in a clinic. And then also the, the third one is the proportion of time intervals. Well, apparently from the literature, like I said, when I did prepare this uh, PowerPoint, this is actually the best to look at loss to follow up. And so I offer this for you uh, to look at is maybe something that uh, when, if you're focusing on that, you, ha you have a, a, a tool to measure that. Next slide. So what does the data say? And, and uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, it was really hard to find recent data besides this time frame, And so uh, we can see that the national rate based on 2018 data is 27%. And that's a mix of clients with insurance and non-insurance. And so we know that historically, probably in our own experiences, that that, that does vary based on if somebody has a third-party insurance or, or if they're uninsured. Uh, so I did a little bit more looking and I found an article in 2019 that said that this can range from 5.5% to 50%. So you can see that the, it's all over the place and so try, you probably know at your own facility what that, what that number looks like, but you can see that we've got a huge range. And when we break it down even further, um, FQHCs, I think, are probably more uh, reflective 
of uh, HIV care because this is a, a population that's pretty much similar in time, terms of uh, SES income and that type that that might be more relative to Ryan White providers. And of course, we know that there are many Ryan White providers are also FQHC providers as well. MGMA, Medical Group Management Association, um, that typically is, you know, if you're not familiar with them, they publish a lot of standards, guidelines for running a, a practice. Um, theirs is lower. And I, to me, that kind of makes sense because, you know, MGMA actually has a template when you look, when you do uh, your patient population in terms of who you serve, they actually have a specific number. And so uh, most practices that are at for profit, they keep their uninsured at 5% and 10% for Medicaid, right? Well, I'll, I'll talk to you in a little bit and it talks about, well, who, who no shows and who doesn't? Well, we know that people with third party insurance tend to no show less versus patients who are on public insurance. So that makes sense. If, if their predominant group of patients is people with insurance and they actually screen out to be profitable, patients like our patients, so I could see why. And like I said, the Ryan White uh, programs may actually have a higher no-show rate than maybe the FQHCs. Again, we don't know, but I'll talk about why it's important to, to start collecting that data to, to, because it relates to other things that why patients don't come back or why we lose them for engagement. And then lastly, it does, I'm sorry. And so lastly, it does have an economic effect on our healthcare system, not to mention maybe the bottom line for your clinic is that they, uh, this was a recent study done in 2020 that out of 667,000 no-shows, that costs the healthcare system approximately $7 million. And so, you know, that's also looking at where if somebody's not coming in for their care, then are they using the emergency room often because they didn't get their care at the time it was more appropriate and now they're really sick and they're going to the emergency room. But it also includes things like missing MRI appointments and those kinds of things. So it's a, it's a big number for the entire healthcare system. Next slide, please. So this talks about uh, top reasons for no-shows or poor client retention. And so, like I said, the, 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 I've got the citations at the back of the presentation. And I created this table because I felt like it's really a little bit easier to understand when you're looking at this. And I'll talk about a few of them, not all of them to, uh, to go through. But what, what I wanted to tell you is that the, on the top row, these are the actually items that we, we found the most, uh, most often that these are, are the reasons given. And the second row is the next level. And then the third row is the, the least prominent level. So it's something that uh, caught me and it makes sense because I worked at an FQ at C for about four years. And that when we would have a, a patient and we would schedule them an appointment, often I, I remember seeing the people at the front desk and it was two, three, four weeks. I'm thinking, how can somebody keep track of that and not miss appointment when it's being given that far out in advance? And so that's exactly one of the top reasons. And so that they break it down even further, a handout that you'll will get at the in the email after the talk is it rate ranks it like, okay, two weeks, four weeks, that kind of thing. If you have a patient that's being scheduled a month out, it's a very high likelihood that they're going to no show just because things happen in their lives and you know that that who who knows what's going to happen in your life in a month so when you've got just the rule of thumb if you're scheduling people out that far you you want that you clearly want to identify those folks to follow up and make sure that somebody's on top of that because they're more likely to no show the next one is and i found this was interesting also uh is lack of awareness of social services in the community. So for example, if I need childcare or transportation or something like that, often patients don't know what's available in the community. And so I have at the bottom of that an offer by the clinic. So often uh, agencies don't advertise their services or make patients aware of them. 
and this is, comes from the literature, maybe you all do, but this is what a lot of agencies don't do. They don't promote their services. So patients may not know, well, you know, if I come from a medical visit, I may get access to other services as well. And I'll talk about that in another slide, a strategy to make that known. The other is uh, on the next, uh, the next item is technology or tech. And that's really from not having technology. And so when patients don't have smartphones, computer access, access to portals, that is a has a relationship with, with no-shows because you can't reach them. They, they can't be engaged with the portal. You know, you can't use the smartphone to get reminders uh, via mHealth, that type of thing. The next one I want to talk about is also um, low patient satisfaction in the clinic. Now I know FQHCs, I remember we, we tracked patient satisfaction scores, um, but if you're not doing it, you want to do it. There's a couple of reasons. Like I said, you see here in, that, in this grid that there's an association between low patient satisfaction uh, with the clinic and their provide, actually the whole provider, not just the clinic, uh, the whole clinic, not the provider, and them not coming back. The other that was really interesting to me was the next one over to that is fear of disappointing the provider, but not just the provider, but the whole healthcare team. So for example, if I know that I'm not virally suppressed, or I know that I've not been taking my meds and the medical case manager is gonna ask me about that. If I'm not doing really well, I may not wanna come because I just don't want that experience of letting them down, you know, because I look up to my provider, I just don't wanna feel like I'm, I'm not a good patient, right? And so that, that was really interesting to me when I was looking at all these different factors. The other one is I wanna talk about staff are not client friendly. And so in my career, I've done a lot of consulting uh, for different types of agencies. And I would be go to clinics and work with them on different factors. I remember one day I was in uh, East Texas and I was sitting in the waiting room and I saw how somebody at the front desk was incredibly rude to a patient. And, and I thought, wow, you know, that's, they're here for care. And, and why, would, why would they be so rude to them? And so when I went back into the office and I said, hey, you know, you may want to talk to some of your folks because they were really rude to this patient. And I'm thinking, you know, there is an article that came out a few years, um, 20 years ago, talked about uh, how you can impact your uh, liability or not get sued. You can be the greatest doctor in the world, but if you have staff that treat patients really poorly, you could get sued more often than the next guy. So there's a relationship there that if the patient either perceives it or they're treating them that way, you know, like mystery shopping, you could find out what's the interaction like. And if, again, if I'm busting my tail as a doctor or, or a clinician to treat people right, and then you've got people who, for whatever reason or not, they're shooting in the foot. So that has a huge relationship because it's like, I'm not going to come back there if they treat me. And so this is also validated in a number of like we said in my work, we, we work with different states and they did needs assessments. And that came up a lot on those needs assessments that why they don't go is because the staff treat them uh, uh, unfair. They don't, they don't feel like they're welcome. The other is um, what I liked about this uh, or what was interesting to me is using only voice reminders. I know at my clinic, we did the automated phones and I found out later in doing research that really the, the payoff for that is really low. People don't respond to them. And it, if you only rely on just one methodology for reaching people like the voice, you miss out people who don't have landlines or you're not using mHealth or you're not using different strategies with our patient population to remind them about their appointment. Because if you only use one method, you're decreasing your likelihood of success. Next slide. So here are some of, the, some of the factors that I found when doing prepping for this talk about effect no-shows. Of course, you know, it's very obvious that, that uh, we see that race has a factor, employment status, uh, people who are uh, unemployed actually have higher, higher rates of, of uh, uh, poor engagement, insurance, uh, people who are insured versus people who are not insured. This was really interesting to me that tobacco use was a factor. You know, we work on tobacco screening and such for the OHS measures, but I didn't know that tobacco use, and apparently when I was reading, reading up on this uh, 
for this preparation for this uh, uh, talk. Uh, it has, because tobacco has such a negative influence on people's overall health, that's why it was, it was, you, it was found to be a factor. And then technology, like I said, the absence of technology will affect patients in retention to care because, because again, uh, if they don't have access to technology to internet, they can't use those patient portals or they don't have a smartphone, they're more likely uh, at risk to no-show. Client age, this is some, something that you probably already know, but apparently youth between nine and 26 have the highest rate of no-shows followed by uh, middle-aged people and then seniors. Client factors, so that's, that includes somebody who has a history of no-showing, somebody with mental illness, somebody with a chronic disease like diabetes or high blood pressure, somebody who is uh, actively using substances, whether it's uh, especially IDU, somebody whose primary language is not English is a factor. And then the one that was really interesting to me was people who are recently widowed or divorced have a higher rate of, as a client factor of no-showing. And then geography, that just has to do with if, if somebody lives over 60 miles from where they, uh, from the clinic, that increases the likelihood for them to no-show. Next slide. So that, I like this and I included this in the talk because you know often it's very difficult when you're looking at improving retention and care and no-shows, something that talks to our patient population and the, and the type of practice that you all are in. And this was published about a year ago and I like this algorithm, you know, get, you don't have to use a nurse to validate it, but what it does is it helps you risk stratify patients who are at high risk for no-showing and patients who are low risk. This is a handout that will be coming to you uh, when they mail out the, the follow-up documents tomorrow, but uh, I, I made this into a handout because this may be something you might wanna try in your own clinic. I thought it was really nice to see this algorithm because I've never seen this before. And the other thing is it was specific to the patient population we serve. Next slide. So these evidence-based strategies, I made them into tables. And so I have a tab uh, table just kind of mirroring this, but a little different. But I want to talk to, I can't, I'm not going to go through all of these with you all today because of the time and in respect your time. But let me talk to you about a couple of things that jumped out at me that I thought were significant. And so treat clients with respect. Now, this is not to say that nobody here on this call does not. But I think that it is something, like I said, working with other states, when they did their needs assessments, this is a big deal. And this was a factor of why they didn't go back. So there has to be something going on, not just within the provider, but I'm thinking maybe the culture of the entire clinic of treating people with a golden rule. You know, we know that patients, if they don't feel like they're welcome, if they're not respected, they're not gonna come back. They're not gonna take their meds. It's, it's got a negative, Cascade. So I think what it does is it tells us to really be looking at our clinic or from a different perspective and being aware of that. The next is, and, and, and it relates to the cultural competency, it relates to our interactions with patients, is using positive reinforcement. So what does that mean? Well, what they found was that when we talk about them not keeping their appointments, we take a negative approach it really does not have the, uh, the impact of what we expect. It actually diminishes or makes patients feel like children, that we're talking down to them, we're not being respectful. But if we use a positive approach that, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're keeping your appointments. Yes, you know, your adherence is 50%, but you know, it's improved since the last time. So what they're saying is that using that positive reinforcement is a really good way to keep them engaged in care and feel motivated. So, so focus on those kept visits. And then on the staffing, this is something uh, that, again, I, I talked about this before, is in my clinic, the, the mantra, and it's probably in you all's as well, because we were in FKC, is everybody, patient care is everybody's job, whether it's a records person or the front desk person. We all, our job is to help take care of patients and give them the best possible experience possible. But I can tell you that in a lot of clinics, that's not the, the culture. 
you know, it's the clinicians. That's what it's about. And the front desk people, especially, they're usually the lowest paid too. They get overlooked. And so that training for cultural competency, we don't want to overlook them. They're the face of the clinic. They, you know, when people come in, if they see a smile and a welcoming attitude, they feel like, okay, I'm, I'm okay. But when we don't have that, that can really torpedo our best efforts. So when we're looking at cultural competency in the clinic, we want to think about everybody. That's even the records people. Again, I've, I've called it a patient as a, at a clinic, and I've been treated horribly by some of these people in the records and think, why do I ever want to come back? You know, I can have my choice of any place, and I get treated like this by somebody. It's like, why don't you go to McDonald's if you don't want to work in healthcare? But this is a problem that unfortunately not a lot of people get it, that we're all here on this call, you know, it, it's about the patients and we're, we have a, a solemn oath to, be, to take care of people and, and make them feel right. But unfortunately, some people get into healthcare who really, maybe they miss the understanding about that, but we can train them. I can tell you that I know for a fact that uh, Texas Medical School Association, now uh, I'm not promoting them, does a training where uh, it's not free, but you can purchase that training. And they go out and they train uh, people who work the front desk on, on how to be patient-centered, how to give good, good uh, quality care. And they do the uh, uh, good experience and they do those, those mystery shopping. So that's the last thing I'm taught on this slide is again, all pet people in the clinic are trained on compassionate and, and patient-centered care. We want to make sure that everybody understands that. Next slide. So uh, hitting on, on a couple more items, uh, like I said, we, you'll get a copy of this in a different format that I think you'll like. But one of the things I, I did want to mention is when we are looking at uh, multiple patient contact methods, one of the things that, that I found was recommended, and I'm sharing this with you, is on intake, ask patients, what's, your, what's the method you prefer to be contacted? Do you like emails? Do you like texts? Those type of things so that if you're using a phone only and your success rate is really poor, well, maybe we need to ask them, what is the way that works for them? Also looking at audio only as appropriate as with technology. You know, telehealth is fantastic, uh, but not everybody has the ability to get access to the internet or uh, has a mobile phone that has that cap capability or they have the data. Well, in Texas, uh, Medicaid allows this as well. Uh, Dallas, who was the agency that funded my original research on this for their out of care uh, program has a great telemedicine uh, guide that uh, the gentleman who's on this call, Mr. Justin Henry, you can reach out to him and ask for a copy. But one of the things it's in there and it's, it's all cited uh, for Texas law, but you can use audio only as appropriate. And so what I'm saying about that is it for those patients who are low tech literacy, living resources, the elderly, that could be an appropriate way to conduct a visit and retain patients. It's, it's really the physician's call uh, because the standards of care that apply for in-person, if you're gonna use audio only, that would apply to you as well. And then also with technology, um, you wanna educate patients and maybe you all don't know about this, but there's a lot of programs, especially with this uh, administration to bridge the gap for access to technology. Uh, low cost internet, the Lifeline, the Affordable Connectivity Program, that's actually again a resource that's gonna be provided to you uh, with the things that are sent out. So I think that that's a great resource to help that with that. And again, um, talking about patients feeling uh, respected, believe it or not, and this has come out of the research that keeping visits on time, you know, cycle times. I know at my FQAC, we, a big project for us was to lower our, our IOB appoint, initial OB appointments, because primarily that's, our, was our patient population was, uh, and so we cut our visits down by 10 minutes. Our patient satisfaction scores went up, but also because part of what the response was on a lot of these surveys is I don't feel respected because I have to wait an hour and a half to see a provider. So there's a two-pronged benefit. One, 
people are going to come back if I keep my, if I if I'm not making them wait forever to be seen, but also their satisfaction goes up as well. I mentioned about social services in the clinic. You can certainly have your partner agencies that supply those services. Maybe put posters in in the, uh, the exam rooms, put up cards so that they they can promote those services. So again, uh, we can help work on no shows. And then lastly, I really recommend that you are tracking no shows and also satisfaction scores. There is a positive correlation such that patients who are unhappy have a higher no-show rate. So it's really advisable that you are uh, tracking no-show rates because like we said, that's costing money. But also you think about this as those are probably the patients who are not virally suppressed, who are not engaged in care. And because you know they do look at that on your OAHS monitoring that's done by the state. Next slide. So in summary, um, like I said, I think it's important to make sure that everybody in the clinic knows that retention and engagement is care is everybody's job. You know, in some places, um, it's just that, that medical case manager who does that follow up. But, you know, it's really everybody. It's, it's really having that pleasant attitude to somebody when they check in, knowing that my experience with that person is going to affect whether they come back or not. So it's the back of the house, it's the records people. So in, in, engagement and care is everybody's job, just not the clinical staff. And then also um, the, the relationship between the client and the provider is critical. I remember that my manager told me, Brian, you know, people come here for the experience between themselves and the provider. It's great about the other stuff, but our job is to make sure that, that experience is the best it can be, to make sure we, make the visits efficient and cut down on time. So the patient, that's why they're here. They're here between to have that experience with a doctor, to, to get education, to get medical care. So we need to be doing everything we can do to make that experience as good as possible. And that's critical. And so if a patient does not have a good relationship, if they're having to wait forever to see the provider, patient flow is not good, or they just don't feel like they're being respected by the clinic, that all affects that relationship with the provider. And then lastly, when you're looking at patient satisfaction, that's a strong indicator of engagement. Uh, that's in, in the research, it's in the references I've got for you at the end of the talk. But so again, you know, patient engagement and patient satisfaction, they're, they're very close. And so the good thing is if we work on one, it helps us with the other. Next slide. So here are the references. So you certainly can, I've got the links as much as possible uh, in the next slide. So you can uh, look at the sources for a lot of uh, the information in this slide. Also uh, in this pre talk, also uh, you can reach out to Justin Henry. Uh, we did write a uh, out of care policy for them. It is, was the bulk of, of my talk today. You can certainly reach out to them and ask for a copy of it. It's, it's only eight pages long, so it's not a big uh, wordy document. But I think, you know, if you're looking at putting together uh, a strategy for out of care or you need to have a policy, I think this is a fantastic uh, resource and it's from another uh, agency in Texas. So it's not like it's coming from California and they don't really have the same population as we do. Next slide. I mentioned the, the uh, couple of the programs that help with getting uh, cell phone access or internet access, and you'll have some resources in the follow-up mail. And then lastly, last slide, I wanna thank you for your valuable time for everybody who's taken the time out today to be on this call, to listen, uh, because I know that probably the, the most precious resource we all have is time, so thank you. <laughs>